Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back from Iceland with another batch of Deep Space updates. Yes, uh, it's actually been quite a busy time. We're going to start on 13th of May when the Chinese company iSpace launched another Hyperbola 1 rocket carrying their Jilin 1 satellite. And unfortunately for them, it was a failure. It is their third failure out of four flights. So iSpace was the first non-government Chinese developer to reach orbit. And they did this using solid rocket motors that they could buy from the government. They built a four-stage rocket and it was about 30 tons and it could put satellites into orbit. They had one success and then since then they've had three consecutive failures. So it's unfortunately not looking good for them right now. Um, but yeah, what else? We had three Starlink launches. Yes, SpaceX has been very busy. First of all, May 13th, same day from Vandenberg. And this was another Starlink launch, uh, basically heads to the south, lands on the barge, you know, off the coast of Mexico. And I would have looked for this if I hadn't been picking up the kids at the same time. <laughs> that was really it. Really wanted to see that one. May 14th, there was also another Starlink launch. And this was the one that I mentioned last time that we were really excited for because the, the airspace closures and the trajectory was going to have it depart to the southeast and land the booster on a barge in the middle of the Bahamas. And we were we thought that would be exceptionally cool because it actually puts puts the barge actually much closer to land, gives a lot of people a chance to see it. But unfortunately, well, unfortunately, I don't know if <laughs> whatever for whatever reason, they changed the plans and it followed a traditional northwest trajectory. So we were denied that opportunity, but I hope that it flies again. However, it was rare and special in that it was a brand new Falcon 9 booster. Nice, shiny and clean. Yeah, and it wasn't even used for some customer demanding it. They just needed another fresh booster. Uh, so yeah, that's that's cool. May 18th, there was also another Starlink launch. This time, the previous one was from uh, Slick 40. This was from LC39A. Uh, Again, launching to the northeast, it was an early morning launch with the sun low in the sky and there's a lot of really cool photographs from people that were there. A really nice one from SpaceX of the booster flying up across the, the disk of the sun. Landed on a shortfall of Gravitas and of course returns. Uh, but some people who uh, keep statistics in mind pointed out that with these launches, Falcon 9 can now argue that it is the most launched rocket in US history because I think that counts to 155 launches, whereas Delta 2, the previous record holder, only has 153 launches credited to it. But, I mean, to be fair, it's called Delta 2 because it was different from Delta 1, different from all the previous versions. Falcon 9 has actually changed quite significantly from the 1.0 version through the 1.1 full thrust and of course block five. So I'm not sure, Yeah, I think if we count the block five as the sort of start of the current uh, version of Falcon 9, that's only 99 launches. I, I mean, at the current rate it's going, it's still breaking records and doing amazing stuff. Anyway, whatever, it's never gonna beat the Soyuz by the way. And coincidentally, on May 19th, there was another Soyuz launch, a 2.1A launching from Plesetsk, carrying a payload into a 570 kilometer sun synchronous orbit. Officially, this was a secret military launch. It's called Cosmos 2556. Experts and people that pay attention to things believe that it is a BARS M reconnaissance satellite. And this is a variety of wide area mapping satellite used for military purposes. It uses like LIDAR and cameras to build maps. So it has a resolution on the ground of about one meter according to uh, sources. So yeah, uh, that's what that is believed to be. But of course, the biggest and most important launch of the week was also on May 19th, Starliner launching on Atlas V. On an Atlas V 422, something which is a a very rare variety, yeah. Um, so we will actually talk more about this in a bit because the launch was successful, but I think it's worth skipping over some of the details until we've talked about the other launch of the week or the final launch of the week, which was on May 20th. It was a Long March 2C, launched a trio of um, communication satellites, it's believed. They're probably not Earth observation satellites because they're in an 880 kilometer 86 degree inclination orbit, which isn't sun sinks, therefore it's not probably not a Earth observation. So yes, yeah, Starliner. Yes, it got off the ground first try, 
There were no serious problems on Ascent. The Atlas V did its job as we all expected it to do. You know, ULA reliable with their uh, Atlas V. Once they separated, well, we didn't get footage of the separation. We only got that later. And I think we didn't, we lost signal very, very early on. Or, and we were reduced to very simple telemetry. I think the reason for this is that Atlas V uses a very low trajectory to try and minimize what's called black zones. That's where if there was a problem and the rocket failed at that moment, the capsule would perform a re-entry and they wouldn't want to perform a re-entry which came from too high up and hit the atmosphere going really hard and fast. So I think it means that they have less communications capability, which means we never see those cool, you know, dual engined uh you know centaur running but we did catch essentially the footage of the separation later on once it separated the spacecraft had to perform an injection into its actual you know proper injection orbit right because if the engines fail at that point it just re-enters on the other side of the planet and it performs a burn with its omax thrusters these are the orbital maneuvering thrusters and apparently during this two of the engines were failed and it was two engines in the same group. So there's four groups of three engines and they only fire one in each group. So one of the engines failed for some reason, it switched over to the one next to it and then that one failed and it switched over to the, the final one in that group. If that had failed, they would still be able to like shut down its counterpart on the opposite side and they would still have maneuvering capability. Uh, it was obviously some concern that this happened very early on in the mission, but the performance of the engines continued to be checked and it seems that uh, they were still allowed to continue to orbit and rendezvous with the International Space Station. I mean, look, I know there's a lot of you out right now, out there right now, just sort of rolling your eyes and saying, oh yeah, boy, and having a bunch of other failures in space. Listen, Dragon had lots of failures of its RCS thrusters in the early days. They took a while to diagnose and fix those and, you know, now they're more reliable. Apollo... Apollo spacecraft, they continuously had problems with their RCS clusters. Apollo 11 had a failure of one of the RCS quads on the cat on the you know, descent module as they were re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. They had a failure in Apollo's, uh, one of their RCS thrusters when, during the Skylab missions, right? That was after years of development. So it's not unusual. This is why you have so many levels of redundancy. This is why there's like 40 thrusters on that thing. Um, but yeah, look, these engines, they're made by Aerojet Rocket Dyne. It's not clear how far back in the chain they go, you know, if, we, if they build the propellant tanks and the plumbing or everything. Right now, there is apparently some finger pointing going on between Boeing and Aerojet Rocket Dyne just over the sticky valve situation that resulted from moisture intrusion. But I'm sure there'll be a little more of that. And I'm sure problems will get solved, problems will get fixed. Right? It's entirely possible that these engines were perfectly fine, it's just that because this was a first mission, they set very conservative values on the, you know, the sensor readings. And because these were slightly cooler or slightly hotter or whatever, they shut them down and switched to the next one, right? That's what happens in engineering. You tend to go with the more conservative values early on and then as you figure out just where your room for maneuvering is, you can open up your envelope. Anyway, Starliner continued, it performed its rendezvous with the International Space Station yesterday afternoon, uh, moved around to the front of the station safely, then moved in, demonstrated the back off maneuver, and then moved in for final docking, and then sat there for what seemed like an eternity as they were checking things out. They had some system problems, they pulled the docking ring back in, extended it back out, and eventually they moved in and performed a soft capture that was, they retracted the ring, hard capture, locked everything in place, and only now a few hours ago, or maybe just an hour ago, did they open up the hatch from the International Space Station, and astronauts have now boarded Starliner and high-fived Rosie the Rocketeer or whatever, right? It's great, we finally got the Starliner to the International Space Station. Hopefully we will see a flight with people on board before the end of the year. Uh, as of right now, that does mean that there are five different spacecraft docked to the International Space Station. There's the Starliner, Dragon, Cygnus, Soyuz, and two Progress spacecraft. 
It's quite a diverse set of visitors. There's really not much parking left on the space station right now. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was definitely the most important launch of the week. Uh, <laughs> big sigh of relief, I imagine, from Boeing to finally get that up there. And from NASA, who have really just been wanting to have you know, two people so there is some level of competition. Um, okay, let me see what else news happened. So I got back from, uh, from Iceland and yeah, the, that black hole image announcement that I misunderstood finally did come. I did a video about that. You can see my description of how exactly this was performed and why it's significant. So this is the black hole Sagittarius A star in the core of our Milky Way. 4.2 billion, oh sorry, million solar masses right in the heart of our galaxy. Our galaxy has a black heart. <laughs> yeah. Um, and speaking of blackness, there was a lunar eclipse, which was all very cool. Well, it was more red because that's what happens when the light filters around the, the you know, the ring, of the, the atmosphere, right? You get an eternal twilight. Uh, yeah, it was very cool. Lots of people really talking about it this time. And I saw lots of really, really cool images and time lapses. I, on the other hand, had a cloud bank exactly where it was until much later in the eclipse. So I missed it. And of course, Neil deGrasse Tyson doing his best to set expectations just came off like a cool kid who thought that nothing was cool. But the best footage of the eclipse or the most unique footage of the eclipse has to come from the spacecraft Lucy, which as we know is currently on its way to the asteroid, to the tr asteroid Trojans near Jupiter. But it turned its cameras back at the Earth and it has the Earth and the Moon in frame and we can see the Moon fade out. And unfortunately we don't get to see it fade back in because uh, they turned the camera off part way through the observation. And I understand the reason behind this is that Lucy is designed to operate at the distances of Jupiter. Therefore, its thermals this close to the sun are not really conducive to continuous operations. So they shut the camera down rather than risk damage to systems by them getting too hot. Still, it is quite a really amazing thing to see. You can also catch the Earth rotating. Uh, the other thing was, once I got back from Iceland, the next day there was the, supposed to be this event at Astra down in Alameda. And I really wanted to go to this, but unfortunately due to COVID exposure situation, I, I chose to stay behind. So they, they were talked about their you know new customers and their plans for improving their current rocket. But more importantly, I think for us, is they showed off their new... Um, they, they showed up basically that they're building a newer, bigger rocket. And this is unlike the first one, it's it's twice the size, I guess, because the engines now have twice the thrust. So the current Astra rocket has five small engines that between them generate something like 35,000 pounds of thrust. The new one will have two engines, each of them generating exactly, roughly the same amount of thrust each. So they showed us a little bit of footage of an engine test. And we had all heard the stories about Firefly Aerospace potentially signing a contract with Astra. When we saw this, we were pretty sure that was a, a Firefly engine on a Firefly test stand. I mean, and that's how you know businesses do this, right? You buy an engine from someone else and you do it. Uh, I just think it was funny that they blurred that all out on one side to hide any details. But I think that's what most people expect it to be looking forward to seeing more flights from it one way or another. Uh, okay, it's so NASA. NASA safety panel have, have basically suspended spacewalks on the International Space Station right now uh, after the March 23rd spacewalk where Rajachari once again found water in his helmet. Uh, that's not a good situation. Obviously it wasn't nearly as bad as the previous incidents but uh, They've decided they need to get to the bottom of this, and so for now, there will be no EVAs in the US spacesuits until uh, they they are solved. Or they will allow emergency EVAs, like if there was an imminent problem that needs fixed via an EVA. Uh, and even then, they do have the Russian Orlan suits, which might be able to carry out certain types of work, and several of the, a couple of the astronauts, I believe, have already trained for the Orlan suits anyway, so they know how to how those work. 
Um, yeah, the NASA spacesuits, the EMUs, are some of the oldest components on the International Space Station. They were built for the Space Shuttle program. The Space Shuttle stopped flying because it got too old, but these spacesuits are still flying. And the, the current plan is like replacement spacesuits in something like 2028, which really doesn't feel like a good plan, honestly. Presumably they're going to have spacesuits for an EVA on the moon in 2024, right? Even though that's been pushed back. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, anyway, anyway, anyway. Moving forwards. Uh, oh, another NASA story that I saw a lot of was several headlines talking about how the Voyager spacecraft on the edge of the solar system is sending back impossible data. Yeah, this is not nearly the story that it was being made out to be because, hey, that's what clickbait is all about. Uh, just basically, there's a problem with Voyager 1 and some of the telemetry it's getting back from the attitude control system is impossible. It's saying it's pointing in one direction, but since they know that it's actually getting, they're getting transmissions back from it, it can't possibly be pointing in that direction. The, gar the data is just garbage in that particular segment of the telemetry. So, of course, they're trying to fix it. Voyager is still working after like 45 years in space. And... You know, you can imagine that diagnosing and fixing a problem on a spacecraft at this distance is a rather tedious process because it takes you about a day to send a request and get an answer. I imagine they are... You know, <laughs> I imagine they're having a lot of, uh, you know, let's get in the mind of the space probe moments as they try to figure out and interpolate what they know. Anyway, I'm sure Voyager will continue to operate for a while still. It is now... You know, it's moving further and further into interplanetary, interstellar space, and therefore the more it can stay alive, the more it can tell us about the, the, you know, the matter that sits between the stars. I am trying to sound all inspirational there, right? Um, uh, well, finally, 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 yesterday we were supposed to have a flight from Blue Origins New Shepard. New Shepard 21 was again supposed to carry the usual selection of half dozen really cool and or really rich people into space, but they had technical problems and that's pushed back the launch a couple of weeks. I don't remember everyone's on board, but uh, I do remember Victor Vescovo is probably the one that I would most want to spend time and hang out with. He builds submarines and goes to the bottom of the ocean. So understandably, going up to space is kind of the opposite of that. Uh, it's also worth noting for people to keep in count that Evan Dick is flying for a second time. A repeat customer is a good thing for a company that plans to make money off this. Uh, obviously, Blue Origin is still planning to make money from their other endeavors, but uh, yeah, this is what is currently actually bringing in revenues. So yeah, that's uh, the news that I can remember. I'm Scott Manley, YC. Well,